Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 806. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 13th, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, or this is Monty Python's Holy Grail. You know the part in the episode where they're building the uh, the the horse, the Trojan horse that turns out to be a Trojan duck. In the background, you're going to hear some construction noise. Drill, 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 drill. They're putting a new awning on Sasquatch. We're at the Tiffin Rally here in uh, Amana, Iowa, and we're uh, having some upgrades installed on, uh, on our Sasquatch uh, while we're here. And today, right before showtime, they showed up to put our awning on. Yay! Great timing. So that's going to be in the background, but George and I are professionals, and we will saunter on. I will push my mute button on my microphone if it gets too loud at times, but... That's just show life. You know, we don't have sets. We're not, this isn't a million dollar operation. This is a, this is a hundred and fifty dollar operation. George, how are you doing this week? I'm tired. I'm happy. It's all the normal things of life. Our daughter called at one o'clock last night, our time, 11 o'clock her time to tell us that she had broken up with her boyfriend of three years. No, not the fishmonger. Uh, the other daughter who has been dating a Tesla engineer. And so we're sitting up in bed, and every so often Susan says, will elbow me, make, saying, make an affirming noise or anything. But uh, I got to tell you, Kevin, it might, one of the things my daughter mentioned is that how lucky and I, my, Susan and I, were my wife and I, we began dating at 18. We got married when we were 21. And we just, last week, we celebrated our 38th anniversary. And Laura said, you know, there's nobody like that around. I don't know any people like that. And none of my friends are getting married. And only one of her friends is married and is now pregnant. And she wishes she had found, can find her life's partner. She's 27. And you guys were together for nine years by the time you were 27. And I can't find anybody. And part of it is, you know, our society is changing, you know, uh, People don't seem to date anymore. They just hang out in uh, sort of groups. Um, but and here's cranky old man time, but they don't make men like they used to. I, I have to say this last generation of boys has been destroyed by our culture. Masculinity is a dirty word. Hard work, uh, integrity, being a gentleman, they're all looked at as being negatives uh, because you're not a victim. You are, uh, uh, you know, model john wayne a man's got to do what a man's got to do to get on well i in the hookup culture is all different I, we, we went through a, a stage like the last three years where everybody was on grinder and tinder and that is kind of drying up as well too because kids are no longer into sex uh when we were younger um and in college people were into one thing in that you know uh that was at least my friends were was uh a sexual encounter and because they have found sex through porn and uh they're it's more of a narcissistic society uh they're just not seeking that the way younger people used to seek it in the 70s and 80s now i have a friend who's a detective and uh she was mentioning her younger co-workers uh that she's working with uh in the detective oh. bureau uh, just don't ha have this idea to go out anywhere and, and find uh, a hookup after uh, at a bar, so to speak. And that's something that uh, occurred all the time in the 70s and 80s, George. Well, there was a very popular, influential culture from Finding Mr. Good Bar about that culture. But even in that culture, um, I'm going to embarrass myself or other people, but I've never known anyone other than my wife and my wife and I waited till we were married. And I, it's what I tell the children at a uh, church, you know, when we talk about these issues, I had, I took, uh, I went out with a young boy who had just graduated from college, took him to our local Chinese restaurant for dinner. His mother was worried about his life's course. So she thought a good talk with the minister would uh, straighten him out. And, you know, I, I tell them, my saying that, you know, wait till you're married, wait till you find the right person, 
don't throw away the joy that you will have in a lifelong relationship with the fleeting, you know, pleasures of the moment. It was so countercultural and so strange to hear him, for him to hear me say that, even though this boy has been in my church for a number of years, the culture in which he's been formed, the culture of his public school, the culture of his music, his friends, his TVs, is that sex is just simply a, it's like smoking. It's, you know, a physical pleasure that you probably shouldn't do, but you're going to do it anyway. Um, so it's, it's hard for young people. And I think it's even harder today than he was during my age. It, in our generation, if you wanted to buy, there was no such thing as internet pornography. And if you wanted to buy pornography, you had to have an older friend buy it at the 7-Eleven. You couldn't just, you know, I've got 12 and 13 year old boys in the church whose mothers have me talk to them because when they should be doing their homework, they're going to Pornhub and looking at stuff that uh, I don't want to see even discuss. So our culture has, and of course I'll, get into what I learned in Rome. This is one of the doors to the demonic in your life when you watch pornography. It's not harmless. But we live in just such a difficult time. And there's so few people willing to stand and say, just stop. And, and we've got to the point where we no longer say no. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, people, who, you know, Christians who are in the society have started to hide themselves when they see uh, some of the stuff happening with Pride Week or Pride Month, Pride Week, Pride Month. It's now, it's going to be Pride Decade pretty soon that nobody says no anymore. And we're afraid to say no because it's, it's become a, a cancel culture uh, that if we do say no, if we do stand up, we will be singled out. It's like living in a communist country. And that's something we need to be wary of. Sorry about the noise in the background. But... That's what you, that's the time you live in, George. All right, first story is a doozy. Last week, before we even got to stories in episode eight hundred five, we we went through a discussion about how bad American uh, legal system is and how corrupt some places are and how biased they are. And uh, George related his story in Florida. I related his story somewhere else, and somehow that was encouraging to some people. And um, the ACNA said, hold my beer. But we're going to talk a little bit about what is happening in the ACNA. If right after we pressed the publish button last week with the uh, uh, episode 805, uh, the ACNA head office published a document from Archbishop Foley Beach explaining in an update what has happened with Bishop Ruck. And, and give me a, a brief synopsis, George, of that document. Well, a last week, uh, Bishop Archbishop Foley Beach released a public newsletter to the ACNA. This is this was in response to a tribunal decision released by the provincial tribunal, which was hearing a case against Bishop Stuart Ruck. Now we need to go Sur back to the beginning. Sur surprise! We have a tribunal. <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> oh, uh. keep going. One of his parishes, uh, I don't believe it was Church of the Resurrection, or, or no, it, it was a mission from the Church of the Resurrection, had a lay leader who turned out to be a rapist. This man has since been convicted and is going to jail for a very long time. And the issue arose how the church responded to the news and the allegations that one of their lay leaders had engaged in criminal conduct. And the accusations are of cover-up and delay and denial. Now, that's not entirely truthful or fair, but that's the accusation. And it will be the provincial, provincial tribunal's job to determine the facts in this case. So there's no factual determination. We're not talking about the rightness or wrongness of whether Bishop Ruck acted appropriately. So the process but, starts... But, but, but let's back up. This is the first action of the tribunal that has existed on paper since the formation of the ACNA, but has never been called together before. Didn't they call something with the Great Lakes, or was that handled informally, there, where the guy had to resign? Yeah, that was no tribunal needed. Yeah, he, he was asked... He, he had a problem with pornography. He was mm -hmm. asked to clean up his act. He fell off. He fell again and uh, he resigned okay well 
situation, so that process starts. And unfortunately, this got into the hold of a group called ACNA2, activists who were pushing a an agenda of attacking the ACNA and it's the integrity of its leaders and the integrity of its processes. So immediately this process whole started out rather as an adversarial approach rather than a fact-fighting or inquisition approach so that those opposed to Bishop Brooke sought to paint him in the blackest of possible terms to prove he was the, another Charles Manson. So this was not helpful. Well, back at last year, October 2022, Archbishop Beach, uh, uh, you know, says Stuart Ruck is coming back from a leave of absence. We've investigated and the canonical preachers, procedures will continue. Meanwhile, in December of that year, three bishops signed a presentment against Bishop Ruck saying that uh, he engaged in misconduct and along with a member of his diocese and i think i think it requires 10 people and if it's a bishop it requires three people i'm confusing the topics so the process starts and then all all of a sudden uh bishop beach reports in his letter that he's surprised to find that there have been appeals and backs and forth uh, with Bishop Brooke, because Bishop Brooke wanted the charges dismissed on these technical grounds, and the tribunal said no, and nobody told Archbishop Beach about this. And then when Archbishop Beach looked into this, he found that the tribunal, four of its seven members, had apparent conflicts of interest in that they either had been uh, witnesses or parties. It, and, and in response to that, people put out statements from David Anderson to the American Anglican Council saying, well, you should read the tribunal's opinion because Archbishop Beach doesn't really have it right. And then the uh, other people have come out with statements saying this is a power grab or a fight within the ACNA. And the thing is, it's none of those things. And I'm going to be unkind and say, this is the revenge of the hobbyists. Uh, in the Episcopal Church, Every three years, we have general convention, and we get these people who in regular life have normal, mundane, humdrum lives, but then for 10 You're days... You're talking about the deputies. There, we, have, we have deputies to general convention who can get the world to take notice that they want Mamu Abubia, Jamu, Abu Amumia Jamal to be free, or we want to, we want to end the embargo against Cuba. And so these people put out these resolutions that have no bearing on the real world, but it just gives the hobbyist something to show that they're important. Now, we have that with canonists in the Episcopal Church and the ACNA, people who this is their little hobby and this is their little project, and they can't seem to see beyond their own project to the greater good. And the tribunals serve to help the archbishop uh, have a clean, transparent, and honest church. And Archbishop Welby Beach is saying, this is far from transparent. I'm being surprised by this stuff. And we've got people with a conflict of interest. They deny it, but still, you know, if the fish still smells, I don't want to eat it, uh, even if it's not rotten. So we, we, what has developed, and I'm giving a, you, you do read the documents and the things that we have on Anglican Inc. because to try to summarize in less than five hours the case it would be difficult. But what we have is a clash of wills. This is not a power struggle because the power still resides with the archbishop and the bishops. But rather, it's just, uh, oh, I hate to be unkind, but it seems to be people trying to be important and making sure that their views survive. I was muted for your benefit. Um, I have a, a little different take on this. And my take is goes all the way back to the formation of the ACNA. I remember sitting in the audience when uh, we're putting together our constitution and our canons and taking votes on this and that, and there were discussion groups on this side and that side, and meetings and flourishes of meetings and discussions, coming back with all the type documents, yes, vote on this, and, yeah. you know, boom, sign that off, and let's make, change the word here and there. And I was sitting next to a guy who I've never met before. 
and I have never met since. And he's looking through here, and he says, "These cannons suck." He's, you know, there's no definition terms. There's no, you know, no good disciplinary terms here. You and anytime you talk about something, it's undefined. You talk about heresy, it's not defined. You talk about sexual health, not defined. How do you, you know? And he seemed to know what he's talking about. I don't mm-hmm. know if he's ACNA. I don't know if he's just a guy sitting next to me, uh, hanging out, or a person for the Episcopal Church who who would know what bad canons look like. And so. He, he he clearly identified in my mind back then these suck and it's going to bite the ACNA in the butt one day and we're here George where um, I'm not a lawyer I don't speak legalese I'm not a canon historian I don't speak canon law this is way beyond my realm but I'm in the realm of an observationist I look and see what other people see here's what the ACNA 2 sees the ACNA 2, thanks guys, <laughs> ACNA 2, don't do that, ACNA 2 sees a good old boy network. The one they warned us about, let me pause for a second. Actually, I do, I think we have this down. I, I want to restart this just a section here. I think we got it down. Well, keep going with the noise. It, I think it adds character. Does it add character? Okay. Yeah, it, it does. does. It's fun. <laughs> okay, all right. So the ACTA 2 says this is this there'll be no justice because there's a good old boy um, network in place. It's a small group in the ACNA and a small group of bishops uh, uh, under that. And you know what? I thought that's silly. There will be justice, and every bishop who's under investigation will want a full investigation and want to be exonerated at the end of the day. ACNA 2 is ridiculous. Believe Me Too is ridiculous. The whole Me Too movement is ridiculous. Of course, a great church like the ACNA would have bishops in it who would want to be exonerated publicly in front of everybody. Bring on the accusations. I am here to defend myself as Christ demands. Um, whoops, end of the day. Okay, maybe we are a little bit of a good boy organization. Uh, maybe uh, there's a, a lot of bias that goes along and there are some opportunities here for people to hide evidence and um, make, and gum up the process and then you know what else there is George lawyers and somebody made the comment somebody made the comment on Facebook what could one tone deaf bishop and a dozen lawyers do that would make the ACNA look so bad. Well, we're going to find out. I think. I, you know, yeah. this is this is frustrating to look at from an observational, outside the church look. What is the ACNA doing? Uh, is it a power grab? No. I, but lawyer, a good lawyer, does not just see one side of, of a law. They can a good lawyer interprets the law on both uh, both sides. You, if 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 a lawyer looked at the law and only saw one interpretation of it, he's unemployed. He is an unemployable lawyer. A good lawyer is able to look at the law and interpret it on behalf of his client. That lawyer is going to go very far in life, George. We have hobbyist lawyers. We have hobbyist uh, can- canon people here, but th- th- there's an adversarial nature to law, and we're going to see that play out here in the next couple months. And it's unfortunate. Um, I've had experience in, I've been an expert witness in several civil trials on the history of Episcopal canon law. Witness in Tennessee, California, South Carolina, New York, bunch of cases when the Episcopal Church was having all their fun. I was, you know, I wrote papers and gave expert opinion. And I've also served with my wife as counsel to clergy undergoing ecclesiastical presentments. Recently, Susan and I represented a, a priest in the Diocese of the Gulf Atlantic. And the difference is between civil law and canon law is that you seek to do God's will in canon law rather than to win. And the priest we defended, he screwed up. Okay? But the bishop who D- Don't was, give too... Uh, please, on behalf uh, of Unscripted, let's not give too much detail. No. The, the priest screwed up the bishop screwed up. It was a complete and utter mess. And the diocesan chancellors went at it as, as, as if they were 
seeking punishment rather than justice. Sure. And and when that's the approach, Susan and I could throw up so much crap to keep these people in court for years and years and years. And when the reality was, I was saying to this young man, look, you really do need to resign. If, and you, uh, if you feel called to another denomination, you know, if you want to be a Baptist or independent, leave in good standing, get yes. your act together and mm -hmm. go because as a career, it's over in the ACNA. Even if you're found not guilty, you're, you're going to be assigned to Okeechobee or someplace, you know, whatever. And so eventually, uh, new bishop uh, comes into office and he, and he agrees to allow this guy to be deposed without cause, without affecting his moral character. He's all about to start his life over again. The point being that when wisdom guides the deliberations, you have a just outcome. When the lawyers guide the deliberations, you have an adversarial who's cleverer, who's smarter, who can spend the most money to get the best legal counsel. And the problem we have with the ACNA is that nobody, I think, has taken Bishop Ruck aside and said, look, is, are you doing God's will or are you just trying to preserve your reputation? Um, and nobody has said to him, okay, we can help you find a way to make everyone satisfied and do honor and glory to God. But the lawyers have gotten involved, so now it's either got to be Bishop Brooks got to be destroyed, or he has to be completely vindicated. And I don't think that's a just outcome on either side. Now, I'm not going into the facts. No, it, it, rega yeah, regardless of the facts... We said, I've said many times since day one, the ACNA has to get this part right. We have to be able to handle these sexual accusations and the process that happens right after the accusation is made with a layperson or clergy. And we have to get that right. We can't be a Roman Catholic church from the 70s. We can't be a Lutheran church from the 80s. We can't be a Methodist church or an Episcopalian church from the 90s. We and, have the to, and the twenties, and the tens, and the twenties yeah. now. You know, we the ACNA should have a process, and if that process is not followed, uh, heads will roll. And you yes, know, but Kevin, the process when you worship the process, then you're worshiping a false god. Um, I understand there is a photo of this, but uh, but I've not seen it. But the tribunal, in responding to Archbishop Beach's uh, complaints, served him with a stay order and summons by taping it to the front door of the Archbishop's office. Now, I got to tell you, this is probably the most tone deaf, and I'll use the word stupid actions from a PR perspective. If you want the people to think the tribunal is a bunch of half-wits who are just having fun playing playing justice. Hobbyist, yeah. Watch Hobbyists who watch too many, too many episodes of Perry Mason, you just serve the Archbishop of the ACNA, your own Archbishop, by taping something to his front door. That's offensive. And it that is. does not and speak of God in there any is way a, that I can imagine. There is a picture of this, and that picture wins. If, if ever displayed in an article explaining what happened, um, that that picture wins and i'll let you think of what that means yourself um the, and here what does this tribunal think well it's kind of the supreme court of the acna i've never heard it before well it's on in our canons it's it's written up really nice and when i i i look and see what's happened over the last six months it's like somebody took dad's new car out and dented it this is the first drive for the, the, the tribunal. This is their first, we're, we're taking it out of the garage, we're gonna start the keys, we're gonna see what it can do. Rev that engine up, and they, 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 they put it back in the garage, and it's got some dents, George. And nobody wants to tell Dad. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and, the, and the dents are, I think, you know, they've got uh, three, three bishops signed this presentment. Mm -hmm. And you talk, Kevin, you talked about the uh, ACNA cannons may not quite what they should be. These three bishops swore in an affidavit they had first-hand knowledge of the facts in this presentment. 
but later in the presentment saying, well, they don't have first-hand knowledge. They're just told about this, therefore they're sure. affirming yeah. it. As part of based investigation. Based upon second-hand yeah. second information. Hmm. How's that possible? They've impeached their own affidavit. They've affirmed that this is true by their own knowledge, and then in the document itself they say, well, we're being told this, because we didn't actually see the X, Y, and Z. Now, if we're going to play the game that they're playing, which is akin to taping service onto the front door of the archbishop's uh, office, then in of itself right there, that whole process gets, you know, thrown out. Because you can move to have the complaint quashed for failure to proceed with, uh, you know, according to the laws. Si now, does that do correctly. justice? Well, but, yeah, it, but here, here we have, nobody's innocent in all this. The, form, the initial forms were not completed correctly. Um, the and follow up stuff wasn't done correctly. Nobody is doing it right because this is the first time doing it. I, I grant you that this is the first time we, we've opened up the tribunal, but nobody's doing anything right here. This is the worst communication in the, the 21st century I've seen. We have better communication between African primates than we do the tribunal and the, the head ACNA office. Um, this is this is an embarrassing moment. It's like sucker punching yourself. What? Yeah. Uh, my wife, as I've mentioned, is an attorney, and she, God bless you. When she she started off uh, working for a Philadelphia firm, and she had a mortgage foreclosure case, and Philadelphia County's Philadelphia County years to get onto the docket, and if you have any substantive changes to the thing, it gets pushed back further. My wife was able to string out a mortgage foreclosure to nine years. These people didn't pay their mortgage for nine years. They paid the property taxes because the state city could take it away faster than the county mortgage foreclosure. But a good lawyer can generate junk and motions and appeals. And this was a pro bono case as Susan was just having fun, depending these poor people who couldn't, uh, who otherwise be out in the street and a good lawyer, you know, a good, I'm not saying they're bad lawyers in this case on either side. Rather, I'm saying that lawyers shouldn't be driving these proceedings. Uh, the spirit of justice, the spirit of truth, the spirit of integrity should be. And Channel, when lawyers. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, see, and, and a good lawyer, you know, my wife was accounted a good lawyer because she could basically, it was like wrestling with the porcupine if you wanted to take on Susan. She could make your life miserable with motions and this and that for years and years and years. That's a good lawyer, but that's not a good person. Uh, well, uh, uh, one of the issues that Archbishop Foley Beach raised was conflict of interest. And mm -hmm. uh, in legal terms, what is a conflict of interest? Well, uh, I raised my family in Litchfield uh, County uh, in Connecticut. And back in 1998, a couple of kids... Uh, in their late teens, took uh, uh, the car out and a baseball bat and just knocked down a ton of mailboxes. Just a ton. And somebody finally got the license plate and they hauled the kids in before the judge uh, on Monday morning after they had all their fun. And I think they got 300 mailboxes in Litchfield. And the, the judge there said, Oh, it's you. I spent four hours yesterday putting my mom's mailbox back together and cementing the, the, the foundation back up because you knocked it over. I'll be your judge. Now, George, would that be a conflict of interest? Yes, of course. Now, I think that's a conflict of interest. So that is an example of, of a conflict of interest. And I think they, they all serve like 4,000 4, years. But um, it, th there are conflicts of interest in law. And we kind of asked people with a conflict of interest to step down. And in this, we have people who know each other because they're in a college of bishops together. They're, uh, the, and uh, I know each one of these individuals individually, and I would count them amongst friends. And so it's difficult to talk about this in terms of, uh, uh, I have a bias. I have an, uh, a Foley Beach bias. I have a Canon bias. I have an ACNA bias. And this stuff makes my head explode, George. So Archbishop Foley Beach says, you know, four of these people are too close to the situation, and they're too close to the situation because um, somebody went to them right away and said, look what's happening to me. 
and uh, you know. And Kevin, you and I received a copy of a, another presentment that is in the preparation against Bishop Brock that's floating yeah. around that lists all sorts of things. And I look through this and I'm thinking, these are just malicious people who are taking who um who, who seek they're sadists they want to hurt bishop brook they don't these want justice. are these are the people that aren't looking for they're looking for a different type of justice absolutely they want to see pain that's why i call them sadists they want to yeah. see pain in bishop brook because they're mad at what has happened mm -hmm. and i feel badly for bishop brook because the honorable thing is to basically say if i've lost the confidence of the diocese i should move on mm -hmm. But if you are responding to people who are attacking you out of malice, it's not a good idea to step down because then you give them carte blanche to destroy everything. Sure. So a, 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 a legal system is based on the presumption of the uh, good intentions of both parties. And when you've got one side that is starting off by adopting the low, dirty road, you just are damning the whole thing to to pain and suffering and, and just enriching law. And so what does the world see? The world sees a good old boy network. The world sees what they, what they said they would see. You have confirmed in them that um, there will be no justice here. And you're doing this through legalese. This is, this, I'm not, this is just my observation. I may be wrong. But the as far as uh, was did the AC and AC receive a good week in the press? No, there is a lot of confused uh, people going. What is all this? And I read an article by the Anglican Apator. I don't know how you. Uh, and I'm going to post a link to this on in the show notes. This is a good description by a person who understands canon law. I guess he's Roman Catholic, and uh, um, he 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 understands and he's put together. What he sees, and he and I agree that this is this is this is effed up, so to speak. That's the word I could use. So, George, what do you think? Well, Kevin, I think in twenty-five years, I'll, I'll give you a personal view. Twenty-five years of writing for newspapers, Anglican Inc., and whatnot, I've only ever had one serious legal threat, and that was through. An article I wrote about a woman in New Zealand who was suing the Remember? diocese for yeah. not having a properly disciplined a priest. And I just basically wrote down the facts. She complained to my bishop, filed resentment against me of conduct on becoming a priest because I repeated facts from the various affidavits. And I could have basically, I, you know, Kevin and I could have survived any assault legally. Alan, Har Alan, uh, A.S. Haley could have knocked this out of the park. Uh, but, you know, I said to myself, well, this story has maybe had like three or 400 reads at the most. This is not the world's most important thing. And at the end of the day, the pastoral thing is to take down the story. Not, don't, not, don't correct it. Just take it down. And allow the woman to go on with her life and harass other people. So I felt I was in the right. I could not be compelled legally, or I even felt morally because I was stating the truth. But the pastoral response to this disturbed woman in New Zealand, and I say disturbed because I do think she was disturbed we, based on it, the tone of her letters. Yeah, we read the, the, her emails to you, and, and she, as the publisher, I got the letters too. And this was a person who was having some extreme emotional suicidal distresses. And we both said, listen, she, she in the Anglican news world, she's really, this is, is, isn't worthy of the news she's getting. Let's drop it. Yeah, and so sometimes you have to take those hits. And now, in one sense, we are fortunate because this was an out of the way story, but an out of the way the place. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't drop our investigations at the AMIA, for instance, because we felt that was true and honorable and we did the right thing and we were proven correct. But there's sometimes when you're dealing with people in this fashion who are so fragile, you sometimes need to make a pastoral decision that outweighs your rights in a situation. And I just wish 
somebody in this broader situation could make a pastoral decision that resolves the difficulties here. Yeah. Well, we are, you know, at a deficit because we're not lawyers. We can't we can't speak at, at that that legal term here. Um, but I completely describe for you that lawyers are able to read a section of law and interpret many different ways. That's how they're employed. And they're able to defend their clients in very adversarial ways. And I think uh, this has not served the image of the ACNA well. It may have served your conscience well, or you think you've won a victory. <sighs> no. So please look for that link of an article I'm going to post, and uh, we'll give you further updates. Um, and no, we're not going to uh, sit here and have interviews with people from each side. We're going to let the process work its way out in this, and hopefully uh, the tribunal and the ACNA and Foley Beach and everybody can learn from this and uh, be a better uh, arbiter of the canons uh, uh, after this is over and set up a better communication process. But right now, that, that, that Corvette has some dents in it, George. Oof, ouch. Let's move on to our next story. Um, going down here, story two, Welby takes our bait. Last week we said, Welby has not offered his opinion on the Uganda gay law story. And, well, <laughs> he did this week, George. Poor Justin Welby. He can't win coming or going. Mm -hmm. He finally released a statement uh, uh, asking the Archbishop of Uganda to reconsider their support for the Ugandan uh, anti-gay law, as it's mm -hmm. called. And he made some statements of fact, and he concluded by saying, this does not conform to our understanding of scripture and our church formularies and this, and that, and the other. Well... Welby received no good from the gay lobbyists in the UK because immediately they said, well, why did it take you so long? And why didn't you go even harder? And why don't, and this is just an example of why we can't trust you, Justin Welby, because you knew the good, but didn't do it for 10 days, two weeks, therefore you're weak. Okay, over the weekend, Samuel Kazimba, the Archbishop of Uganda responds. Oh, and by the way, uh, the Archbishop of York followed with a "Me too." Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll let it stay. That's so cute. <laughs> what 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 he says? Me too. Oh man, uh, <sighs> but I don't think highly of the Archbishop of York's intellectual uh, brilliance. But okay, he's Steve a great. Wa he is a great watcher of television. Yes. Okay. Stephen Kazimba responded by saying, "Look." This law didn't criminalize homosexuality, meaning it was once legal and is now illegal. It's been illegal ever since you British came in and wrote our sodomy laws during the colonial era. We've just rearranged some of the penalties. Now, you complain about no one should be put to death for homosexuality. We agree. We are opposed to the death penalty. And oh, by the way, the death penalty is reserved for aggravated homosexuality, which is if you are deliberately infect someone with HIV, if you know you have that, if you rape somebody, and you're HIV positive, and if you uh, rape a child, all of which are crimes severely punished in the United States. If you rape a child in Florida, you're not going to go to the gas, you're not going to go to old Sparky, the electric chair, but you're never going to see the light of day. You're going to get a life sentence. So if that, uh, so Kazimba's point was that, and second, why are you picking on us and Ghana? A few months ago, Ghana has Ghana has a, is toughening its anti-gay uh, laws as well, and basically saying, and you're, yet you're silent on other places like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and all this and that, uh, the Palestinian territories where they kill gays, you know, they execute them as well, and are much more virulently anti. They're much more virulently homophobic than we are. So, Justin, you know. You're ignorant of the situation, you're ignorant of the cultural context, and you're choosing who you want to attack. And then, for good measure, the Church of England Evangelical Council, who, oh man, they did a, well, we're against this, but we're for it in parts and against it in parts. The virtue of keeping your mouth shut 
needs to be explained to the Church of England Evangelical Council because yeah, they're I, being driven I, to make stupid responses by gay activists in the UK. They just should have kept their mouth shut. I I don't yeah I don't think their their press release was necessary. Um, the, the the actors who are affected by this most well be in Uganda had both uh-huh. spoken. The Archbishop of Uganda schooled Welby. Mm-hmm. He wrote him a, a response letter and just laid it out. It, we have these laws because you came here first and made these laws for us. Ouch. Okay. <laughs> we're just we're just reassigning the penalties and we're making sure that uh, the rapists uh, don't get away with it. Uh, is that really a problem? And Welby, in a follow-up interview after he read this response from the Archbishop of Uganda, seems to really have kowtowed, seems to have yeah. backed off, George. Yeah. And meanwhile, in Uganda, there were popular protests against Justin Welby. University students gathered in the, in front of Parliament saying, the British are not going to tell us how what is right and wrong. They're not, you know... Who, who are the British to talk about morality and about uh, justice when they came in and ravaged and raped our land and all this and that? So there was, and remember, only two MPs out of the three or 400 members of parliament, Uganda voted against this. So if just Justin Welby's uh, approach that this is just pure homophobia and we need to, and we need to bring these ignorant Africans to the 21st century, he's missing a lot. Well, on Monday, Justin Welby spoke at the Religious Media Festival, and he took and he uh, answered questions from uh, the audience. And he was uh, the moderator was an ITV news presenter, so it was a fairly polished presentation. And Welby basically shifts again, basically taking on board the criticisms that Uganda has said that, well, you know, we the and and basically saying to his audience who was you know hostile to Uganda, saying, well, the Ugandans think just as badly of us over our support of gay marriage and gay rights as we think hostily, host- badly of them for their opposition to these issues. So we need to have a bit of context. So Justin Welby appears to have taken on board Samuel Kazimba's criticisms. But of course, now the backlash is hitting Welby again, that he's soft on these evil Africans. The gay lobbyists are coming out and the usual usual hysterics are having breakdowns. And this is my opinion, mind you, but I feel very badly for Justin Welby because he really has found himself in a no-win situation. Much of it is of his making. But he just was put into a situation that he has not handled well. And one of the questions to him, do you take any personal responsibility for the decline of the Church of England in attendance during your tenure? And he said, yes, I could have done more. I could have done better. And I believe him. I believe him when he says that. Um, He was asked by a young woman, uh, can the Church of England not be more clear on sexual morality that you need to wait till you're married to have sex? Can't we just go back to that? It will make life so much easier. And Justin basically said, yes, you're right, we should be doing that. So Justin came up with a lot of mea culpas on Monday. And maybe I'm sensing a conflicted man, maybe I'm sensing a tired man, uh, but I am seeing someone who seems to be running low on energy and ideas. The, the biggest struggle you have is the one he put in front of himself when he took office. I am going to make and keep the peace. Mm-hmm. Unity first. And at some point, these are, you know, many slogans out of the book 1984. You can't make peace. It, it, it's not possible to make it. It has to have a, a natural occurrence. Uh, peace happens when all parties desire uh, to be at one. And in Christendom, we want to be one with the Father first. That makes us one with each other. And you can't force us to be one with each other if we're not one with the Father. It doesn't work. And I think that's the first struggle he ran into was his plan to keep the peace first. And in doing so, he's now found himself in, and I don't want to let up my Star Trek nerd list, he's in, the, in a Kobe Achi Maru. 
he's in a no-win situation where he put uh, the cart before the horse and here he finds himself completely struggling to reach the end of his tenure as the Archbishop of Canterbury because he started off on the wrong foot. You shouldn't have sought peace first. You should have sought the gospel first, the mission of the church first, the mission of Christ first. And boom, here you are. You're in a no-win scenario and you sound defeated. You know what time it is? And when I sound defeated, which is probably daily, it's time to repent. It's try time to be humble. It's time to say, I'm not doing it right. God, help me do it right. And he's, you know, the, a vacuum is created in the international power structures by Justin Welby of the Anglican Communion. Mm, sure. In other words, we've all the talks about, Welby had a little comment. Well, the, the head of the Anglican Communion doesn't have to be a white European. Um, basically saying that uh, it can be Johnson Tomo. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is not going to happen. Uh, but the uh, he's making the right noises. But at the same time, the blob, the power structures, the second, the first and second tier management are really jerking the strings of Justin Welby these days. There's a move in the General Synod to impose a code of conduct. And what a code of conduct would be on its surface is that you can't say bad words and you can't impugn the motives of other people, just like you cannot call someone a liar and a thief without having some evidence to back it up. Otherwise, it's just pure invective ad hominem attacks. Well, the problem is this will be applied by the machinery against those who speak out against unpopular, against what are popular. So let's take our friend from this show, Sam Margrave or Luke Appleton, members of General Synod who are very prominent in their voice against the current trend of the House of Bishops. Opposing that can be termed hate speech by gay activists and hate speech would lead you to be kicked out of General Synod. So a code of conduct is really a code of censorship and that who will decide what is bad conduct are the people in power. Now, at the last General Synod, the Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, engaged in ad hominem attacks against Ben John, a lay member of Synod, and uh, Cottrell was absolutely, inexcusably arrogant, mean, stupid, and cruel. And if anybody violated a code of conduct, it would be, it was Stephen Cottrell. Now, would a centrally administrated team looking at the code of conduct ever discipline the Archbishop of York? Or, or would they discipline a, a lay delegate from Coventry or Exeter or someplace, a person who is not one of the elites? So Welby is allowing censorship to creep in of views uh, within the Church of England. If you don't agree uh, with what the boss says, out the door you go. And it's also a, a one rule for the elites and one rule for the plebs. Plebs. All right. Before we get our next story, I have to let this guy in one second. I have to get my power cord. Just stir it there. Friends, while Kevin is off, it was his birthday this past week, so do wish him a happy birthday in the comments. Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, uh, a show. A couple minutes. Right? Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm going to edit this out, George. Nice try. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I need to need, leave, leave a little bit in. <clears throat> One second here. All right. Save the day with the power cord. All right. Uh, three, two, one. All right, moving on to other news other than the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, oh, the Executive Council's meeting in Rhode Island. The Episcopal Church has an Executive Council. I know I attended a meeting sometime uh, long ago in Delaware and uh, somewhere on the East Coast. You know, I guess it was New Jersey. And uh, I will never get those uh, two days of my life back ever. It, it was a waste of time. It was just people talking to talk and uh, making sure that the press was not in the room if ever there were conflict between 
personality is sitting at the head table. And I was excused from, all, I, I attended four or five different meetings and I was excused from each meeting about 20 minutes in. And this is probably 2005, long time ago, George. So what's gonna happen at this executive meeting of the Episcopal Church? Well, there's a new uh, president of the House of uh, Deputies, Julie Harris. Um, and Michael Curry is ill. He ha appeared by videotape. He's been having internal bleeding and whatnot. But the general, the executive council has adopted the attitude of never mind the ship is sinking full speed ahead. Um, they acknowledge that attendance is tanking and everything is going down, but we got a lot of money. Do we have a lot of money because more people are giving? No. It's just that our investment advisors are doing pretty well on the billions we've got socked away. So the who is it that said the definition of insanity is keeping doing the same thing again and again and again, even though you know it's wrong? It's been attributed uh, to Albert Einstein, but I think uh, some wise person way before Confucius said it. But uh, yeah, but let's give it to Elvis, Einstein. El <laughs> or Elvis Presley, somebody like somebody. that. <laughs> But the Episcopal Church's executive councils decided that we need more wokeness. We need more craziness. We need more diversity, inclusion, and equity. We need more of what has driven us into, into collapse over the last generation. And I think, oh, geez. Well, oh, and friends who are not American. Jesus is not a swear word like Jesus or something. It is not taking the Lord's name in vain. It is an American colloquial expression of mild disappointment. It's spelled G-E-E-Z. -E -Z. And my wife, every time I do a dad joke, my wife will say, jeez. So it, it's a common no, expression. Go, oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when I do a dad joke, everybody laughs except my wife and my kids. So what's the point of a dad joke? You know, I don't know. Yeah. But the, exec right. the executive council is just no, no change there. Uh, mm -hmm. Amateurs playing, playing with other people's money. Uh, All right. Well, let, let's do some real world stuff here then. Um, in the real world, Christians are being persecuted, and we'll cover China in a minute. But there is a man in Pakistan who happens to be Anglican, and he is sentenced to be hanged in Pakistan for receiving a blasphemous cartoon of Muhammad sent to him by a Muslim who has not been arrested, because Muslims can do that, I guess. And I just want to put this up here because George... If you are the Archbishop of Canterbury, head of the Anglicans, this is what you should be responding to. You should have a special press conference just for this man because this is not just. Not even by Pakistani laws is this just. But he's going to be railroaded by the good old boy Pakistani Islamic network of people. Yeah, Norman Norman Massey in 2019 was arrested for receiving having a WhatsApp image on his cell phone. Mm -hmm. Now they deny he denies this, of course, and the police have had his cell phone in their possession for several years, and it is not uncommon for the police to fabricate evidence after the facts to get their convictions, especially in blasphemy cases. So the guy's been in jail awaiting trial. He's finally sentenced, and he's sentenced to execution. He's going to be hung. This is something that is going to happen. In Uganda, no one has ever been executed for homosexuality and no one ever will be. And so it is a probab it is a, an, a likelihood that may or may not happen. Whereas in Pakistan, this is a sentence of death that has been passed. It has not yet been carried out. And this is on one of his own, if you will, flock, if you consider him the first among equals in the Anglican world. Have we seen him respond? Have we seen the mayor of London or the first minister in Scotland who are of Pakistani origin respond to this? No, everybody's deciding to pick on Uganda for what might be 
and give Pakistan a pass on what is, which is the persecution of Christians. Yeah, I think, well, we've talked enough today about what I think. So, <laughs> but this is this is real life. This is what is happening now. And this is where uh, an Archbishop of the Middle East and the Archbishop of Pakistan, uh, or the Archbishop of the Middle East and the Archbishop of Canterbury, should be the loudest. You know, we're trying to have uh, ecumenical relationships with you. We're trying to build Islamic Christian relationships, and yet you're persecuting uh, our our lay people. You can't you can't kill them. And we and we don't you know. And it's getting worse. It get less. Last week we talked about Hong Kong and China, and they're now the government is, is it, it's even getting worse now, and it's a persecution of Christians. The government, all ministers of religion, that includes Christian minister, Protestant ministers, Catholic priests, Muslim imams, Taoist and Buddhist uh, monks and uh, religious uh, practitioners, must be registered with the government and have a, and. Facebook, if not Facebook, but have an uh, online licensing and registration, mm -hmm. which allows people to inform on a Christian minister. If a Christian minister does something that uh, can be considered anti party. So this Wait. is not just the info. I'm sorry. This is a, well, no, this is a repeat of how Mao came to power. Mm -hmm. Take out the intellectuals and have families report on each other and friends report on each other. This is, a, this is a repeat, George. And the official Christendom is not helping matters by lionizing turncoats and traitors from the communist revolutionary era as the sorts of Christians we should model. Um, there was a recent conference at a Bible college where three Anglicans were held up. Uh, two of them were lay people, but one was a bishop who after the revolution went over the communists. There were two Anglican bishops. Uh, one was K.H. Ting, very famous Anglican bishop and this fellow and they basically went along with Mao and were became tools of the Communist Party the other Anglican bishops disappeared into the Chinese prison system and died so some were martyrs and some were turncoats and traitors and these turncoats and traitors were they lived they were given positions within the three self patriotic movement and so long as they towed the party line, they were allowed to survive. And this is the sort of Christianity, not the martyrs of the past and of the present, mind you, but those who gave in and conformed to the party. So, so you're getting it so that clergy and young Christians are being taught, you know, conformity to the state is the ideal. Ministers have uh, anybody who wants to drop a dime and inform on a minister or a mom can do so and they'll disappear into the gulag and children in many parts of china are not allowed to be enrolled in school the new rules you may not be enrolled in school unless you sign a paper saying that you will not educate your children in religious practices and this applies to the uyghurs and uh in uh, eastern turkmenistan and to chinese christians uh, if you raise your child as a Christian, you have to be a secret Christian. You have to lie to the government that you're not doing it if you want your child to have an education. All right. That is the end of our episode. Oh, we got one more. We got one more. Oh, Stephen Croft. Do uh, you want to save that for next week? Or how quick is it? No, it's a quick one because right, we quick. don't know the deep. Last week, we talked about how we weren't. Stephen Croft is the uh, so, uh, son. Andy Croft. Yeah, is the Andy. son of Stephen. Croft. Yeah, Stephen Croft is the Bishop of Oxford. Bishop mm -hmm. of Oxford is done some things that, if he were anybody else, he'd be set down for misconduct for all this and that. And his son Andy it was the number two at Soul Survivor, Mike Pivolacci's uh, organization. Yeah, number two. And last week we said we're not going to link the two stories because we don't have, know anything bad about Andy. And we're not going to tar the, fa the son with the sins of the father. Well, of course, after we made that broadcast, Soul Survivor suspended Andy Croft and another woman, Ellie Martin, I believe her name is, from their ministry at Soul Survivor for not informing 
and telling what they knew about Mike Pivolacci's uh, uh, abuses. Yes. Escapades, abuses. Mm -hmm. So here is Andy Croft. The, I think he's in his 30s or early 40s, the son of the Bishop of York. He is suspended for not taking action. Uh, Bishop not, of York? I'm sorry, you're right. Bishop, he was Bishop of Sheffield, then That's Bishop right. of Oxford. That's right, yeah. Andy Croft, the son of the Bishop of Sheffield, now Oxford, <laughs> was suspended for not speaking up about abuses he could have known about or should have known about. His father, who had who had knowledge of abuses, took no action for years, and then blamed the victims once it became public, is still in power, while the son is being treated like a normal priest with misconduct charges. So the two-tiered English justice system and for clergy is blindingly evident in this case. Now, I don't know if the charges against Croft are true or whether it's an overreaction by a sole survivor. We don't have the details, but just the, that they're suspending him pending an investigation. There's already been the investigation in the Oxford uh, with Stephen Croft, and it's he's been found guilty uh, of misconduct, but no action against him by the Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode, episode 806 of Anglican Unscripted.